Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hi, I'm Sandy. And I am so grateful that you are here this morning. And um, I'm excited about the different things that we're going to do. So hopefully when you walked in, you um, received a packet because this is going to be interactive. And hopefully you also have a glow stick. And I'm going to invite you to crack it and wear it. You can wear it around your um, lanyard or it kept popping off my wrist, so I put it around my lanyard. But the title of this session is Watching Students Glow. And so I always use glow sticks to kind of add to the mood of what we're doing today. So I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, I'm going to go through an activity rather than stand here and share my resume with you because that's very, very boring. I am a recovering middle level teacher and therefore I still act like one. They put a mic on me today and I said, really, I'm a middle school teacher. You don't need a mic, but they're recording it, so we're doing the mic. So in order for you to get to know me a little bit better, and I like to model effective strategies that work with early adolescents, so early adolescents being 10 through 14 or 15 years old, there is an activity called Just Like Me. So as I'm about to reveal something about myself, if it also matches something that you like or you do, you will simply call out just like me. So for instance, oops, let's get going here. Hello. You were working just a moment ago. Okay, here's the, oh, this would be good if the um, internet froze now. Let's try this one more time. Technology, right? Just like me, right? Okay, there we go. Okay, my favorite color is blue. Okay, excellent. I am addicted to Netflix. Oh, thank you. We will have to talk. Stranger Things comes out, right? Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Okay, I consider the Big Island home. Oh, yay! I'm from West Hawaii. Are we Kona people? Just like me. Just like me, yay! Okay, I live here now. I live on Oahu. I'm being acclimated very slowly, but I do consider the Big Island home. Um, okay, one of the things that are not in my skill set is I am unable to fold a fitted sheet. Oh, thank you. Okay, so, and I have figured that life is too short to worry about those things. So, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Another not in my skill set is I don't cook. And so, when my family invites me to family gatherings, I'm asked to bring the paper towels. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. So, just like me. Exactly. Um, I am passionate about middle school and middle level learners. Okay, my peeps are in the house. Therefore, I'm affiliated and I'm a member of the Hawaii Association of Middle Schools, HAMS. Oh, people. Okay, by the end of today, you will all be a hammy, okay? Because Hawaii Association of Middle Schools, we support all middle level learners and teachers. And I'm a proud public educator, public school educator. Yay, okay. so. Again, you can do an activity like this with adults. You can do it with kids. I have found it's a great way when new kids come to school, they can introduce themselves to one another. They get creative. They get fun. They have fun with it. So today's focus is going to talk about character education, um, some SEL, how they roll together. And of course, if you are a DOE educator, you are familiar with the GLOs. And we're going to see how they all tie together. So here are two quotes, um, the first one by Teddy Roosevelt, to educate someone in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. Second quote, whether you follow football or not, you're probably familiar with our Marcus Mariota, and he said if one is successful, the entire state is successful. So if you would, would you turn to someone that you're sitting next to right now and just process or reflect on these two quotes and how they might tie into character education. 
So go ahead and just have a conversation with a neighbor about one or both of these quotes. Five, four, three, two, one. And if you can bring your conversation to a close. Is there anyone that would like to offer an aha, an insight, or a takeaway that you just had from your conversation with someone else based on either of these quotes? Please, please. <laughs> I took the time to disagree with Marcus Mariota. If one is successful, the entire state of Hawaii is successful. Being in a classroom where one or two kids get it and the other ones don't, mm. I don't feel that they're having success. I feel like I need to bring us all to the same place. Yeah, yeah. So... Thank you for sharing. No, because we, we, we need to have those different perspectives and, and insights, so I appreciate that. Other thoughts? I think, um, Please. First one, it's even more difficult now because they are focusing more on the, the standardized testing, making sure that we're hitting these goals, and our society's reflecting no morals right now. So trying to be that compass in the classroom is... It is tough. So trying for educators to be the compass in the classroom when society doesn't always demonstrate the morals that we want our kids to have. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. So one of the ways character education um, can be incorporated is through quotes. And so I use a lot of quotes, whether I'm working with adult learners, uh, student learners, or through presentations. And it really does give people an opportunity to share various viewpoints, as well as expand our collective thinking. So I thank you for that. I don't know if any of you have seen, there's many of these perspectives online through social media. This one happens to be the funny or the humor behind the perspectives of a teacher. And I know some of these pictures are a little dark. This first one, what my friends think I do, and it's a teacher reading a book and the kids of course are sitting so nicely, you know, definitely not middle school. Um, what my mom thinks I do, and that's Einstein right there. What society thinks I do, and the teachers are all having coffee, and they're happy and relaxed all the time, right? What kids think I do, whether you follow Harry Potter or not, you know, is that Snape, I think? Um, yeah. What I think I do, this was from Goodwill Hunting, Matt Damon and Robin Williams, and the, just the amazing thinking that was going on. And then what I actually do, and it's hard to see a teacher with his head in his hands, and all the bubbles around it talking about grades and meetings and curriculum planning, right? So these are the perspectives that different people often have about teachers. And many of us that have been in the trenches for a long time can relate to having to clarify and debunk some of those myths that people have about education. So here is your first task. And you, the packet that you received when you walk in the door has four boxes like this on the front. And I'm going to ask you, just for about three minutes, to think about what you think you know, maybe what you've heard or what you've experienced related to character education. So what students think it is? Any experience that you might have with character education, what do students think it is? what parents may or may not think it is or know about it, what educators think it is, and what it could be. So would you go ahead and spend about three minutes just jotting down some bullet points and notes in any of those boxes? So we'll just popcorn out any ideas through these boxes. Um, so let's hear a couple for any of you if you're implementing or using character education in your schools or aware of it in any of your um, classes, what do students think character education is?
What if we're not using it in our schools, but we're just guessing here? Go ahead, by all means. Um, I think they think it's being taught to be good in mm -hmm. school, like doing your homework, following directions, and getting good grades. Okay, so maybe behavior related. They might think it's something like that. Yes? My kids think that it's the volunteering in class, the being a class leader, oh. and being responsible for the stuff that they want to be responsible for. Okay, okay, excellent. Anyone else? Working with their teams and having uh, a task and outcome. Okay, perfect. So, and all of those fall under versions of character education because it's building a member of our society that's going to be a contributing member at some point, right? How about parents? What do you think parents suspect character education is? And they don't use the same vocabulary we do in education world, but what might they think character education is? Anti-bullying. Anti that's a big one. Absolutely. Yes? Life skills. Life skills. I've seen uh, distrust of it because it's that's what my job is as a parent. Ah, some distrust because I should be teaching character and values to my kids hands off with teachers, right? Okay. It could be the opposite too. And it could be the opposite. Like I'm, I'm feeding and clothing them and I'll let you take care of them. Oh. And when you have both of those parents in the same room, then it becomes a balancing <laughs> act, right? Oh boy. How about educators? And that includes us? And it could be even people who don't work with kids but are still in the field of education. What are we starting to feel or hear or think it might be? Yes? Yeah, I'm not sure what, what it is. I haven't heard of this, but I would say human etiquette. Human etiquette. Okay. So when we think of etiquette, it's kind of polishing maybe a behavior or something. So human etiquette, being a polished human being, po possibly. Thank you. When I talk to parents, I tell them, uh, it's developing the people who we would like to have as our neighbors. Oh, there we go. Yes. Who do we want our neighbors to be? Who do we want our community stakeholders to be? Thank you. I think sometimes like, uh, practicing strategies so that children learn to be problem solvers those strategies through it. Very good. Almost providing them with a toolkit so that they can do that. Thank you. And I saw a hand over here. Sorry, I'm coming from a high school perspective. Yes? But at the high school level, a lot of teachers take the stance that is, it's important, but it's not as important as content. Ah, uh, yes. And never apologize for that. <laughs> I never apologize for being in high school. Absolutely not. Okay, so this again, just to warm you up with what we're going to be talking about today. I was at a middle school for, in the middle school realm teaching for almost three decades. And we were tasked with this um, on a regular basis. So whether a school has a formal advisory program or not, there still was this need and urgency with how are we going to grow these young um, we call them walking hormones, but how are we going to grow these young adolescents into good people to be contributing members of our society? So character education, the term would come up, um, if you've been in the DOE for a long, 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 long time, just like me, um, before the GLOs, we had the SLEs, which are the um, student learning expectations, and there were even precursors to those. So it was alphabet soup and it was all these initiatives being thrown at us and what were we going to do and how we're we going to make sense of it. So I started doing some digging. Um, if you're not familiar with AMLE, the Association for Middle Level Education is the national organization that supports anyone working with 10 to 15 year olds. And when I say anyone, it's not just teachers. So parents, community, the coaches, mentors, anyone who works with this audience, um, AMLE is a good place to start. The affiliate I mentioned in my um, opening, HAMS, Hawaii Association of Middle Schools, we are an affiliate of AMLE. Most of us are familiar with ASCD and then Edutopia. So I started with these three sources to get as much information as possible to help build a viable curriculum. So AMLE 
has 16 characteristics, which I know you can read on this slide. You have access to this later. But these 16 characteristics, again, really address what is needed for 10 to 15 year olds. And the research has shown in brain development, second to only a toddler, or from baby to toddler, the second time in the human growth is between 10 and 15 years old that the brain is developing, the body is doing all these wacky things. It is the second biggest growth spurt that, the, that human beings go through. So we cannot, we can no longer treat sixth through eighth graders or fifth through ninth graders like junior high because that doesn't work for their developmental needs. So this we believe has a number of characteristics that tie into the social, the emotional, the physical and the cognitive development of early adolescence. The GLOs also have been crosswalked with the habits of mind. If you're familiar, a lot of schools do habits of mind. That's another version, <coughs> excuse me, of character education and how it's growing good individuals. So I took a look at that. Okay, do we want to be a habits of mind school? Do we want to roll this into our curriculum? Some of you may be familiar with CASEL. This is, one of, this is probably the premier organization that supports SEL and uses this wheel that is divided into five um, areas to help guide um, the work that um, teachers, anyone who's working with any students, not just middle school, so pre-K through even college, these are the five components that are now being addressed and rolled into SEL. So here we were with all of this information, didn't know what to do with it, and even along came ESSA, or the Every Child Su Succeeds Act, right? Um, this slide made me very excited, as you can tell by my little star here, because when we were introduced to the new legislation, they showed what student A from, and student A isn't just from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Th student A was actually back from the 1800s of when schools were established, which was based on the Industrial Revolution and bells and everything else for uh, factory workers, right? So ESSA is moving towards, but this is what we want our students to be able to do. And take a look at this. I did not Photoshop this slide. <laughs> this slide, all of those are the GLOs, and this is in the ESSA legislation. They have a couple of others, or they may have wordsmithed some of them, but basically they've identified the same thing that Hawaii had already identified um, as the key components for some kind of structure. And then we have HA. How many of you are familiar with Nahuana Ao or are rolling this out in your school? Okay, so this is a BOE policy that is not just for classrooms, not just for students and teachers, but it's the structure for all of the DOE as a whole. So from the superintendent's office, trickling all the way down to schools, um, our SCCs, community involvement, and everything. So, and there's a presentation being done with this, and you can also research it. I have links for all of these for you in this packet, by the way. So, when I started doing the research for our character education, this was at Konawina Middle School, HA hadn't come out yet, so we were using the other resources that were already in development, but I have since incorporated HA into that. So I came up with a framework to help best explain to not only audiences like yourselves that I work with, but even with um, the students when we're helping them understand. So the framework, or one, there's always more than one, one framework for the resources we have here in the state of Hawaii for character education is based on knowing, doing, and being. So what do I need to know? What do I need to be able to do? And then how should I operate? How should I be as a human being, as a contributing member to a, of our society? And you can see how these three, the castle um, wheel with the five competencies from SEL, our own GLOs, Department of Ed GLOs, and then the HA structure all roll together. And again, you have um, access to this entire PowerPoint. I want to make sure I'm on the same page here. And I also want to make sure I'm not running out of time. 
So, oh my, I love this quote, and it, of course it didn't work out. So this quote goes back to, we cannot be the type of educators that simply tell kids what to do without behaving the same way. So this quote says, children learn more from who you are than what you teach. So if a teacher does not understand or know how to behave with good character traits themselves, kids are smart. They're going to pick up on this. So we're going to do, what I always do is I start with the teachers before I even um, tackle the students. This also is in your packet, and I'm going to invite you to turn to this page called Bing Glow. We're going to play Bing Glow, and I do have prizes. So we'll see um, how we do this. So all six of the GLOs are on this card, um, but I think they're on like four times each to make the 24 boxes. As you, as you play bingo, you need to get five in a row. So this is the same as a traditional bingo game. However, when I give you a statement, you can only mark one of the GLOs. You cannot mark it four times on the card. That would not work. So we're talking, we're looking at ourselves as educators. We are looking at how am I a glowing teacher? How am I a glowing educator? So I'm going to put up a statement. If this applies to you, go ahead and mark it. Put an X or a star or something on your Binglow card. So I watch TED Talks. So if you do that, I want you to think for a moment, which GLO would that align with? So you're a professional, you are making sure that you're educating yourself. Which GLO would watching TED Talks as an educator apply to? And just go ahead and mark it down to whichever one you think it is. Here's your next clue. I use Google Drive as a teaching and learning tool. I use Google Drive as a teaching and learning tool. I have presented at educational workshops or conferences. So I've been a presenter at a workshop or a conference. And once you get Binglo, you need to call it out so you can get your prize. Here's your next one. I'm signed up to take a PD class this year. I'm signed up to take some form of professional development this year. I use a newsletter, blog, or one or the other, to communicate with students and family. So I use a newsletter or a blog to communicate. So think, which of the GLOs does this align with? And it could be more than one, but you can only check one. I collaborate with colleagues on interdisciplinary units or project-based learning. Here we go. I am able to differentiate my teaching for various learning levels. I'm able to differentiate for various learning levels. <gasps> we have a Binglo? Okay, so you need to tell me which GLO is yours aligned with. TED Talk. Okay, TED Talk, so which one? Self-directed learner. Self -directed learner. Um, Google Learning too. Okay, so you had two that lined up, okay. Uh, PD class. PD class. Okay. And uh, technology. Was that the Google Drive one? Yeah. That would be your technology? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the free one, the middle one was free. Very good. Okay. So you win your own pack of glow sticks because we're glowing today. Okay, but I heard somebody else. Who else had a bing glow back here? Okay, what? I'm going to come close to you because the microphone needs to pick it up. But start talking. What? How did you align some of these with your um, GLOs? Um, Self-directed learner with TED Talk. Okay. Um, Google Drive. Um, ethical use of technology. technology. Um, see, the PD class is... Uh, Self-directed learner. Good. Um, 
community contributors, a blog, or actually a newsletter um, to the family. Oh, okay. Um, which one did I miss? Um, quality producer. I think that's the one I did. Quality producer is um, differentiating oh, using technology. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. Oh, you. you can go to a dance tonight. Very good. <laughs> so. As you know, and you probably listen, some of you may have checked some of the same things but thought, well, I put that under a different GLO. Perfectly fine, because this is how you are internalizing what it means to you, right? Let's do a couple more. I collaborate through vertical aligned conversations. So if you're at the middle level and you talk to the high school teachers and the elementary, that's one version. If you're a third grade teacher and you talk to fourth and second, that would be another vertical alignment. So however you in interpret that with one of the GLOs, go ahead and check that off. I incorporate STEM into my practice. Bing Glow, yes, okay, tell us a couple. I believe you, but we want to hear a couple interpretations. So the differentiation, uh, I have a complex thinker. Okay. Um, collaborating with my, my um, fellow educators, colleagues, uh, community contributor. Um, I don't use STEM, I use STEAM. Thank you. <laughs> um, so effective and ethical user of technology and um, vertical communication. So I'm actually a high school teacher and I communicate a lot with uh, Thank you. the middle school. Thank you. Um, as effective communicators. Yay! Okay, and you can go to the dance with these other people who won <laughs> prizes too. Okay, last couple. Um, I read professional journals, magazines, or blogs to expand my thinking. I'm going to go through these quickly. I use feedback from others to revise my products and practice. So we always are works in progress ourselves. We want to get better at what we do. I, u uh, I use, oops, there shouldn't be enough there. I use working agreements with peers, students, and staff. <gasps> we have one more bingo. Bing Glow, okay, because I'm going to run out of prizes, but that's okay. Okay, tell me real quick a couple of your Bing Glows. Uh, professional development and self-directed learner. Okay. Complex thinker, I find it uh, with the differentiation. Yes. Yes, I have to. Really Absolutely, that's a huge one. Feedback from um, to produce quality products or. That's how we get better. I, I actually collaborate with high school with the English teachers Good. for the community. Good. Are you middle school? Yes. Yay, one of my people. Very <laughs> good. Thank you so much. OK. So that is one way to start with making sure that teachers understand. Before we can roll out any skills to students, we need to understand that how they apply to us first. And otherwise, and especially if you're working with middle level learners, they can smell when you're not quite you know, genuine with them, right? And then they are not going to buy in. So if you can embrace it. I was so lucky when um, I was at the middle school level, we had team time built into our schedule. So as a core team, we would meet, and the students were out at electives. So a lot of times they still needed to come to the restrooms or go to their lockers and they would pass by and they would actually see us sitting together. We may have been planning an interdisciplinary unit. We may have been preparing for student-led conferences, something of that nature, but they saw us working together. So it was very easy for us to sell the concept of being a community contributor when we were walking the walk at the same time. So we made sure anytime we were talking about the GLOs and modeling, we would model it for them and then give them real applicable um, examples of how it applies in real life. So you have also in your packet, I think it's on the next paper, like a gingerbread kind of person. And I'm going to invite you for a couple of moments to jot down, I'm going to pop some examples up here, but I want you to now think specifically, how do you glow as an educator? And notice I'm not using the term teacher because we have a whole range of people in this room, from administrators 
to coordinators, to classroom practitioners. So as an educator, how do you glow? And so I want you just around the, your gingerbread person, and if you want to decorate him or her, add a little hat, add a little dress, whatever you want to do. Um, but go ahead and put some, um, now that you are thinking more in GLO language, how do you practice being a glowing educator um, in your role? And let me give you about three minutes to do that. Okay, as you're wrapping up your final thoughts, I'm going to start to pop some generic examples. These have been collected um, from teachers through various audiences. So one form of being a self-directed learner as an educator would be attending professional development, um, conferences, pursuing any advanced degrees. Some of you mentioned that in the Binglo game. Um, community contributor would be working with your team or if you're in a department, a GLC, any collaboration with peers um, and even non-educators, stakeholders. Um, if you've ever done accreditation, gone through the WASC accreditation process, it's vitally important that you're able to be a collaborator and a community contributor with all the stakeholders um, in that arena. Effective communicator, it's daily instruction for practicing teachers, but also if you're delivering information through meetings, um, publications, sharing at conferences. Complex thinker, um, some people talked about this, the differentiation, so designing curriculum to meet the needs of all students is huge. Effective and ethical user of um, technology, whether you're using um, Oh, I, have, I still have GAF on here. I should have changed that. It's G Suite now, right? So, but whether you're using class websites, blogs, Twitter, or G Suite for any of the Google applications that are out there. And quality producer, any reports that you put out, letters to parents, don't we want to make sure those don't have any typos in them? Um, and communication, even with fellow educators, if you're sharing docs and producing, again, an accreditation. Um, documentation would be a good example of that. So I don't have these in your packet, but if you find um, these useful, they're downloadable at my website. So we found we would use two tools. This was called a one tool, one school planning sheet, and it's basically per month, starting with August and going through May. And then the one class, one task planning sheet really helped us, it's the Monday through Friday, and it's a little hard to read here, but the top row says individual tasks, the next one would be um, the small groups, and then whole group or large class. And the reason this was crucial, again, I always go back to knowing my audience and this being the middle level learners. When I sat down with my teammates and my counterparts, if every one of us was doing individual tasks like book work on Monday. Can you imagine those poor kids after four or five periods of doing the same type of learning? It was grueling and it was painful. So when we would sit down and we would do our planning, we tried to use a form like this so that we didn't all give a test on the same day or we weren't all showing movies or videos on the same day. We really tried to spread it out. I did science a lot. So when my labs were happening, it was a good balance to when one of the other teachers needed to do maybe more written assignments or more individual assignments. So, and then the one school, one tool really helped with themes and thematic units that were going on. And this was a conversation that um, was easily had between whole school um, as well as um, individual teams or departments. So another part that was incorporated a lot was um, reflection. And this is very crucial to social emotional growth and character ed as a whole. So many of us had this poster, the one on the right in our classrooms, and I'm sure you've seen this before. So watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. And watch your character, it becomes your destiny. So a lot of times, we would talk about that and break it up into bite-sized chunks so the students understood what it meant. But we used a lot of incorporating it. 
The graphic down below represents, and if any of you have gone through tribes training, you're familiar with community circle. And so a lot of times we would bring the small groups of students together and focus either on a quote, focus on an issue at hand. Sometimes it was a bullying issue. And we, it was a safe zone for students um, to share in. And, and that leads me to this concept of what is your happy or tell us about your happy. So I worked in a school, as many of our schools, that had high, um, low socioeconomic population. And we had a lot of kids that would almost um, be nervous or anxious about going home on the weekends because they didn't know what was going to happen. And so they tended to act out, and some of the behaviors would bubble up to the surface on Friday afternoons, or maybe even on Fridays as a whole if we we're approaching the weekend. So we started doing community circles where we were very purposeful in asking the students to identify the good things or the positives that had happened that week or the preceding couple of days. So when they left, they at least felt that they, some, they accomplished something or they felt good about something that week. So it affectionately got known as the happies or, you know, tell me about your happies or, you know, what were your happies today? And the kids started using this lingo as well. So many of you know that if you're ever out and you have a substitute and then you have those kids that come and rat out the substitute when you come back. So I had one of these situations. I, I, I don't know where I was, but I was gone on a Friday. So on Monday, one of my little helpers, right, she was almost hysterical, and she pulls me aside, Miss, Miss, you're not going to believe what happened on Friday. And of course, I'm thinking she's going to tell me what all the naughty kids did or poured the whole thing of fish food into the tank, or I didn't know what to expect, right? So she's pulling me aside, and she's like, the substitute. The, and I said, OK, well, what happened? Did she forget to pass out a paper or you know, something? No, Miss, she wouldn't let us do our happies. And this little girl, and she was sixth grade, but that was such a big, important part of her anchor almost. She needed to be able to do that circle at the end of a week and share her happies and identify her happies because it helped her um, go into the weekend. So what did we do on a Monday morning? We started with the happies because I knew she needed it and probably a lot of the other kids needed it as well, which ended up rolling into one of my books too. Um, this also is available as a download from my website, and you can go ahead and, and take it down. So with the reflection and the self-assessment that we did with the kids, we really um, rolled it into goal setting. And we had the students identify the doable goals that aligned with the GLOs that they could be accountable for. So they would set a goal and then either, it could be weekly, monthly, or quarterly, they would reflect on how well they were able to accomplish those goals. So this typically was a two-sided sheet and we did student-led conferences and so we would put it in their portfolios and this became evidence and a piece of an artifact that they could share with their families. Okay, we're gonna try, this is a two and a half minute video. Andrew, I'm going to plug in the sound. And let's see, we had it queued up on YouTube earlier. So at Konawina Middle School, for about 20 years, we incorporated um, student-led conferences and we did portfolios. But the portfolios were not set up by subjects. It was not like this is my math subject or my math section, my social studies section. We set the portfolios up by the GLOs because we wanted the students to be able to speak to how are you a self-directed learner? How are you a community contributor? So this, and you're not, oops, sorry. Let's just watch this. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to my student-led conference. Uh, this is my electronic portfolio. Inside of it, I have lots of examples of like, um, what a GLO is and what it means to be to be glowing or using your GLOs. The GLOs are like life skills that help students better themselves for the future. The six GLOs are self-directed learner, community contributor, complex thinker, effective communicator, quality producer, and eth effective and ethical user of technology. This is a sample of how I'm a self-directed learner. This is Cornell Notes. 
it's basically you take notes and then write in little, um, little comments and a summary. Effective communicator is the ability to communicate communicate effectively, whether it's in like speaking or in writing form. Um, one example of this jilo is my Japanese journal. That's where we had to write um, sentences in Japanese. Um, and that's effective communicator because it deals with writing too, and that's communicating. Here's a sample of Complex Thinker. This um, paper I picked because we had to think, of, um, think about how we're going to do it because we had to find the hypotenuse. And she is quality producer, and they give explanation and answering questions. Nice handwriting and presentation is good, and they do not do minimal amount of work, and they always try their best. Um, to work with uh, different technologies and use them the correct way. Uh, an example of this is working on the broadcast. The broadcast is the thing that we do in the beginning of school that sends out all the information to um, all of the classes. So like what's coming up, like extramurals, different things that's happening in the school. Other work for effective and ethical use of technology is the Daruma project, BS Celebrity Project, reached research for Kulia, and this electronic portfolio. The, the portfolios, again, were arranged by the GLOs, and the students chose which work from any of their classes aligned with the GLOs, and then they spoke to their parents or whoever the audience was. So what you couldn't see in that video is generally, that was the spring um, conference, so that was by the end of the year. They had already gone through most of the year. They were very proficient in speaking to the GLOs, and many of them would invite six to eight family members to come and hear how they would share their exit um, portfolio by the end. So I wish it was clearer. I wish we had the technology at that time, but uh, the kids did it, and it still kind of speaks um, to what they, they're able to do. So in your packet, I've created a resource sheet that has both the URLs and the QR codes um, that you can scan if you choose. There are a variety of resources. Um, the top one that references the middle level library of resources includes two of the articles that have been published. I mentioned AMLE earlier. That's the national organization, um, the Association for Middle Level Education. So they have a magazine that comes out. And by the way, they're always looking for practitioners to write. So if you're interested, um, I would suggest submitting something. Um, so the first article was about the advisory and the GLOs, and similar to what you just saw in the video. And then the second one got more specific with SEL, or social emotional learning, specifically, again, at the middle school level. And then there's an, uh, some of you I saw taking pictures of the castle wheel. Um, but I have the link in here so you can get a cleaner um, version of that. The Naho Penaao or the Ha framework, I have a link in here for that as well. And then there are some free GLO um, downloads for you. And then the last link is this presentation, this slide deck. So if it's something that you want to go back and reference um, a little bit later, you are more than welcome to. So. From the work that I have done, um, and I, I rolled it into the research that I did for my dissertation, I produced two books. Um, one is the title of this presentation, Watching Students Glow. Um, and I have copies of the book up here if you're interested in seeing them. And then the other one, the children's book, is A Happy A Day Keeps the Grouchies Away which came from starting with that happy circle with the students. And even though it's a picture book, and a lot of people think it's more appropriate for maybe pre-K through about second or third grade, any of us that have worked with middle level learners know that you can use picture books to drive a point home. And so that was kind of the purpose as well. 
So my contact information is here. Um, I'm available to chat. I think I'm under the time. Where's my Eamon? He's been helping me out. Buddy, am I doing good? Okay, I'm under time, right? Okay. What questions might you have that I can um, answer for you before we um, disperse here this afternoon? Or still morning, I suppose. You guys don't even act like middle schoolers. <laughs> yes? Uh, at our school, we constantly uh, meet with each other, the teachers and things like that. Yes. The students are becoming more aware of that, so we should actually share our experiences with them so that they can see how we're... That we're human how beings. We're, how we're doing the same thing as them. Yeah, so that yeah. They can understand. That's how we felt mm -hmm. it was the best way to roll it out to them, is when they realized that it was not just do as I say, not as I do, but that we were being transparent not in everything, but we were being transparent in how we were operating our classrooms and how we were lifelong learners ourselves as educators. It started to help them embrace the concept of, uh, at least for the GLOs, it really helped them understand that. You know this morning in Mark Prensky's presentation, and he said stop, teaching, stop treating students like pets and treating them like people. I, I was very excited. In fact, I tweeted that out, so that would be, I think a way aligned with this is treating them like human beings and respecting them by showing them that this is how we act as professionals as well. So if we have like career, our career ed activities and things like that, we should <clears throat> maybe brief the guest speakers and things like that on GLO so that they can... If it's appropriate. The question is, should we brief guest speakers on the GLOs? I think a lot of guest speakers that come in, they want to do the best and serve the audience as much as possible. So if you find that that's relevant or any other background specific to your school that would help a guest speaker, then by all means, I think that that would work. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, how do you, I mean, I know this is a hard question. But uh oh. I don't have time for hard questions. I, I'm in charge of our advisory program. Oh, <gasps> yay! Let's talk. How, how, how do you like get buy-in from all teachers? I give people things. I give them glow, glow sticks and candy and food. Um, so, yeah, so that's how you buy in, right? You buy people. No, <laughs> I'll erase that. Um, <laughs> no, I, we, it didn't, we did not get to that level overnight by all means. And so we started, I found people that shared my philosophy and I found people that wanted to take a risk and try things. And so we started at the time, we, just, um, we started just with our seventh grade team because that's who was brave and they wanted to take a, a chance. And then it moved to eighth grade and, no, I'm so sorry, it went to sixth grade and then it went to eighth grade. So then eventually it was a whole school um, adoption. But it was not overnight, it was not a one year even buy-in, it took some trial and error and um, baby steps by all means. But, um, and, and what helped was that we had team time so that we could problem solve and plan together. So, but I'm more than happy to chat with you and please, yeah, email me. I want to thank you for your time and, um, and sitting through sometimes a quirky and, and um, you know, middle school-like presentation, but I'm glad you're here and it's lunchtime and I'm hungry too. So I'm here if you want to talk story, but thank you and have a great rest of your day.